Hi, I'm Kevin Winthrop. I'm a professor from the School of Medicine in uh, Oregon Health Science University in Portland, Oregon. I'm here with my good friend, uh, Dr. Ted Maris, who also um, has a lot of interest in non-tuberculous mycobacterium like myself. Ted? And I'm from the University of Toronto. I'm a, a respiratory physician there, and I have a major interest in non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease as well. So the first question goes to Ted. Uh, Ted's an epidemiologist, so, so am I. We've done a lot of research both together and uh, defining the incidence and prevalence of this disease. And really, we're talking about pulmonary non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease today. Uh, the first question is, Ted, comment on an incidence prevalence and uh, maybe start a discussion about risk factors for disease. What have you found in your work? This disease was not uh, really w well understood, and we had no good handle on how common it was. And we've started to sort of scratch that surface in the last few years. And we found that it's remarkably common, far more common in areas like Canada and the U.S., far more common than tuberculosis. The incidence is probably somewhere around in Ontario, 8 per 100,000 people per year. And the prevalence seems to be significantly higher than that, although it's hard to get really good numbers. What about your work in Oregon? Yeah, the thing I like about Ted, we, we've done a lot of the same types of studies in different places using sometimes different methodology, and we seem to find the same thing all the time. We find similar incidence, similar prevalence, a similar predilection for uh, certain subgroups of patients, which I think we'll talk about next. But uh, at least in Oregon, and again, this is Oregon, but it's population-based data, and it's, it's, it's what we see, and there's no real bias. It's like everybody in the state of Oregon, which Ted also has the luxury uh, in Ontario of really finding everyone who uh, coughs up a mycobacterium, for example, in their sputum, and we can find out what happens to them. In Oregon, we see this, this is actually slightly more common in men before the age of 50. Uh, and then after age 50, it starts to be more common in women, and the prevalence and incidence of disease really skyrockets mm -hmm. after around the age age 50 roughly. And I think, uh, I think that's also true elsewhere in the country. There's been similar studies done by, uh, we have a close colleague in Washington DC, she's done kind of national studies. We have other friends who've done more regional studies. And really we're all finding similar things. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I agree completely. And that really gets us to the area of risk factors and thinking about age. It's if you plot the incidence and prevalence of NTM lung disease by age, it just really skyrockets once you get into the 60s, 70s, and even and much more in the folks in their 80s. And so age is clearly an important risk factor for this disease. Yes, yeah, so why is it? Yeah, so it's a super question and not really easy to answer. I think part of it is that this disease hangs around, it occur, it develops over many years, and it takes many years to become symptomatic. And I think folks may get infected sometime in middle or older age, and it takes a decade or so perhaps to come to um, uh, present itself and then to get diagnosed. Yeah, this, this disease is very slow and insidious. We really should clarify what we're talking about here. We're talking about mycobacterium avium complex, which is Mycobacterium avium and Mycobacterium intracelluliare, two different species but really closely related. We call it a complex. Most disease, probably 85-90% of pulmonary non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease in, our, in actually North America, I should probably say, is due to MAC. And so th this is what we are primarily talking about. And it is an insidious disease that takes some time to, to progress. I agree with Ted. I think a lot of these people actually develop disease or their infection when they're in their 40s or 50s and it may take 15, mm -hmm. 20 years for them to get sick enough and have enough lung damage that, that they actually present to the doctor and get worked up. And even after they present, it sometimes takes some time to, to make the diagnosis. So what is it about the older lung? I mean, what are the risk factors? What are the underlying lung diseases that predispose to this? Yeah, um, so we, we know that people with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, a big component of that, is a strong risk factor. And we know that that's far more common in older people. In most people, it takes a cumulative number of years of cigarette smoking, and that doesn't pile on until you're a little bit older. We know that fibrosis of the lung, pulmonary fibrosis, is far sure. more common in older people. So I think those are two examples but there's got to be more to it than that. Think about the folks who don't have those diseases. Right, so the other main disease is bronchiectasis, and there's various reasons for bronchiectasis. This is dilation of the airways, and the airway becomes 
damage. It tends to collect debris from the environment, including mycobacterium, which I think we should mention something about environmental risk factors in a second. But uh, there's no question that this is a more common uh, entity in older individuals as well. And actually, the risk of acquiring pulmonary MAC with bronchiectasis is, is actually much higher than it is with COPD or emphysema, even though uh, those are the risk factors, but probably it's several fold higher if you have true bronchiectasis. Um, what, what about immunosuppressives? We like studying those. Yeah. I mean, we found the same the same yeah, thing. Abs right? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so, we're getting really good at treating inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. We're getting good because we're good at suppressing the immune system. When we do that, unfortunately, people run into problems. The fantastic group of drugs like the anti-tumor necrosis factor, anti-TNF drugs that are so great in RA, rheumatoid arthritis, they are important risk factors for mycobacterial disease. We knew about TB for more than a decade, maybe two decades, but we know now that they're very important for non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Yeah, it seems we have an aging population and there's more people with these accumulated uh, risk factors, both chronic underlying lung disease, uh, immunosuppressive use, prednisone. Let's talk about prednisone. It's an old drug, inhaled steroids, which became very common to be used in people with chronic underlying lung disease the last 15 years. Uh, I think there's a number of risk factors that we can point to that might explain this increase in um, incidence. Um, you know, we see something different in Europe, don't we? I, why? Yeah, that, that's really difficult to reconcile why our European colleagues tend to see less of the bronchiectasis group and more of the COPD group. Is it because of smoking rates? Uh, is it because of their healthcare systems and the way they investigate patients and maybe don't, look, don't do CT scans to look carefully for the milder bronchiectatic disease? It's a good question. However, our colleagues in Europe are telling us that in the last decade they're seeing a lot more of the type that yeah. we see here. Yeah, and there, there may be a difference in the environment, so that, that's the segue to that. There, there are risk factors probably in terms of exposure, but, but they're hard to get at. I mean, mm. these bugs are ubiquitous. They're in the water supply systems, they're in lakes, rivers, they're in the dirt, they're in probably the peat, mat, peat moss bag you bust open uh, before you go garden every spring. I mean, it's hard to avoid these bugs. And so, uh, I, I don't know, have you looked at risk factors in terms of the environment in Ontario? Or? It's, it's so, as you point out, it's so difficult because these things are just everywhere. And our patients certainly can drive themselves crazy trying to avoid the germs to prevent reinfection, for example. Trying to actually study the risk factors is, is really quite difficult. Yeah. We haven't done that in Ontario, but I know you have on the West Coast. Can you, can you share some of that? Yeah, I mean, in Oregon, uh, again, it was population-based data from Oregon, but we found um, there was some association with population density, which I think you found also in Ontario. The people that were more likely on municipal water supply systems versus well water uh, were, were more likely to have this. And we, and we do know from environmental studies, it, it, is, it is more likely that you'll find MAC in municipal water supply systems, probably because of the extensive piping and the biofilm formation of these uh, systems where, where MAC really likes to live. Um, that being said, this is a fairly rare entity, mm -hmm. right? Most people who are exposed to municipal water supply systems have no problems, so. Yeah. Such an interesting point. We did look at the water systems and their association with the NTM lung disease and did find exactly as you described, high population density, more of it, and a few other factors like surface water, lakes and rivers, bigger risk than groundwater. Yeah. There, there are definitely some uh, exposures that, that we know can cause disease. I mean, people have done uh, risk factor studies with individuals where they found it in the hot tub and they found the exact same MAC in their lung or in their shower. I mean, we know that there are settings of infection, but, but by and large, uh, a lot of these settings are hard to avoid necessarily. So. Yeah. So I think so, we're done. Are we done talking well, about risk factors? I think we're done talking about risk factors. <laughs> we're never done. But, but I guess that, you know, that only goes so far, and maybe our patients and our colleagues want to think about what's new in treatment for NTM lung disease. Well, good. Ted, thanks. That was fun. I think we maybe exhausted the discussion about risk yeah. factors, or maybe not. We well, can keep going. I, I think I could talk about this for a few hours, but people are going to be a little bored of it. Yeah, there are but more so, risk factors, though, out there. We just haven't found them yet. Absolutely. It's a so pleasure anyway, to talk uh, about it. That was fun. Thanks very much, and uh, we look forward to more topics to talk about.